The evolution of transplantation is one of medicine's great stories, and much of it was written by Tom Starzl. And while there have been other contributors, there are a few instances in which a single individual has been so predominantly responsible for establishing an important new field. While growing up in Lamar's, Iowa, a small town in Iowa, Tom enjoyed the usual boyhood activities, Boy Scouts, school, high school basketball and football, playing trumpet in the jazz band. Uh, but there was another experience that was an uncommon one, working as a reporter for the town's newspaper, which were owned and published, which was owned and published by his father. And this may have given him a start toward being a gifted writer who would one day become the most highly cited medical author of his time. After graduation from Westminster College, he was influenced by his mother, a nurse, to pursue a career in medicine. Entering medical school at Northwestern, this is his father, who incidentally was also one of the pioneers and most important pioneers uh, of the genre of science fiction, which is interesting in terms of Tom Starzl's later career, career, which really recapitulates science fiction. Uh, entering medical school at Northwestern, he supported himself as a copywriter for the Chicago Tribune. And he soon developed a serious interest in neuroscience and dropped out of medical school for a year of full-time research. He implanted electrodes deep within the brain of experimental animals and recording from these electrodes helped to define the ascending reticular activating system. The five resultant papers that formed the basis of his PhD thesis are still being cited. Although his mentor, Horace Magoon, incidentally an APS prize winner in neuroscience, although Ma uh, Magoon urged him to remain in neuroscience, Tom Starzl instead completed medical school and then began a surgical residency at Johns Hopkins. And there he did research on cardiac physiology. In dogs, he developed the model of complete heart block and its treatment with one of the first experimental pacemakers. And after four years at Hopkins, he moved to the University of Miami to complete his surgical training. And there, in a laboratory he built for himself in an abandoned garage, he continued to do research. He had become fascinated with the liver and its double blood supply, the blood supply consisting of an artery, as with other organs, and also a venous channel, uh, which delivered venous blood originating in the pancreas and intestine to the liver. And Tom was interested in the importance of this venous channel. Uh, he developed in dogs a model of liver transplantation to study it. And by hooking up the new liver in various ways, either with or without the portal vein, he discovered that the blood supply was vital to the health of the liver. And if the transplanted liver lacked portal vein blood, it shrank, as in the uh, liver on the left there, uh, as compared with the normal liver, which had the normal blood supply, transplant, transplanted with the normal blood supply. Uh, these exper experiments had very profound significance many years later in terms of lipid metabolism. But at the time, they were important to Tom only in that they allowed him to study the metabolism of the liver. And these experiments were done without any thought of transplantation to replace failing livers, but only to study the physiology and, and metabolism. At this time, it would in fact have been pointless to uh, consider liver transplantation as a therapy since there was no way to prevent rejection of allografts. Immunosuppressive, immunosuppressive drugs were yet to be discovered. So far, the only transplant that had worked, the only one that had been successful was one where the donor was an identical twin. After he finished his residency, Tom wasn't sure what to do next. 
he had, ex he had explored neuroscience, cardiac physiology, and now liver metabolism without committing himself to a career in any of these fields. Discouraged and frustrated, he considered going into private practice to support his growing family. He remembered himself as bursting with energy and ambition to achieve something meaningful, meaningful, but what? He likened himself to a missile searching for a trajectory. Ultimately, he decided to prolong his education by training as a thoracic surgeon and by doing this, incurring the criticism from his wife's family that he had become a perpetual student. But then, just at this time, he learned that investigators in Richmond, Virginia, and in London had discovered in animal experiments that the anti-cancer agent, 6-mercaptopurine, and its derivative, Imuran, would delay rejection of kidney transplants in animals. This is what Starzl said about this development. That the operation of liver transplantation was developed just for physiologic studies. But then, by the end of the time, and, and that period of time was 1958 to 1960, for the first time, experimental drugs showed up on the horizon. And I thought, wow, um, this operation that I developed for other reasons could be used to treat people that um, uh, were dying of liver failure. So he had found his trajectory. It would be transplantation, and in particular, transplantation of the liver. Starzl spent the next three years back in Chicago at Northwestern University, where he'd gone to medical school. And after completing his training there in thoracic surgery, he returned to his studies of the liver, but now with the goal of transplanting it as a treatment. Since he didn't yet have access to the new immunosuppressive drugs, these studies were of unmodified transplant rejection. Rejection of his transplants always began with a few d within a few days of their transplant. But occasionally, and quite mysteriously, and without any treatment, it seemed this rejection seemed to slow or almost to stop for a time. This was provocative, and Tom began to wonder if he could find a way to reverse rejection. The notion would become the key to a major breakthrough, perhaps his most important one of all. In 1962, Starzl accepted a faculty appointment at the University of Colorado. Also, just at this time, he was able to obtain a supply of the new immunosuppressive drugs, the drug Imuran in particular. And he began to test Imuran in drugs, in dogs, with liver and kidney transplants. He soon made a crucial observation that was missed by all of the other investigators who were also testing this new drug at the same time. They ad had administered or were administering Imuran as a single agent or simultaneously with other drugs, including prednisone and other cytotoxic drugs. Rejection was mod modestly delayed by these protocols, but it always resumed, progressed, and was always fatal. For the next two years, Starzl experimented with many different ways of using the drug. Eventually, he found one way that allowed consistent success. When Imuran alone was given at the start, rejection always began, just as it had for other investigators. It began within days or weeks, just as others had found. But if he then treated the dog with massive doses of the adrenal cortical drug prednisone, he could always stop rejection. He could always reverse it, something that had never before been considered possible. Subsequently, he could reduce or even stop immunosuppression without recurrence of rejection. Encouraged by his dog experiments, he began to try his immunosuppressive trick in human transplants. 
He started with the kidney, realizing that unless he could succeed with this simpler procedure, it would be unwise to undertake the more complicated procedure of liver transplantation merely to test these drugs. He was elated to find that in his human patients, his results in reversing rejection were just as successful as they had been in the dog. He could stop rejection, something that nobody else knew. And then in September of 1963, he was given a chance to reveal his exciting findings. A small conference had been organized by the National Research Council to assess the experience with human kidney transplantation in the world. About 25 of the world's transplant authorities were assembled. Starzl, a young and virtually unknown newcomer to the field, had been invited to the meeting as an, after, as an afterthought and wasn't expected to speak. One by one, the established experts revealed the status of the field up to this time and their own experience. Their results were all terrible. Less than 10% of their recipients had survived for as long as three months. Most of their patients had been treated with total body irradiation as an immunosuppressive maneuver. Hope was then expressed that the new immunosuppressive drugs might be more effective. And Joe Murray from Boston, a future Nobel Prize winner, reported the work with the first 10 patients treated with the, dru with the drug Imuran rather than with total body irradiation. Of these 10 patients, one was surviving, although it was being rejected at the time of the conference. The other nine had died within six months. So it looked like the new drugs, at this time at least, the new drugs seemed no more effective than radiation. And the mood at the conference was so gloomy that some participants questioned whether continued activity in human transplantation could be justified on moral grounds. The gloom, and this is the uh, group at the conference. These are the senior transplant experts in the world and the young Thomas Starzl included. Uh, after this, uh, these discouraging presentations, the gloom was dispelled, but only by a single presentation, the one given by Tom Starzl, who described his first 30 treated, drug-treated patients. His unique protocol had reversed rejection and allowed 80% one-year graft survival. Tom realized he had more surviving transplant patients by far than the rest of the world's experts combined. The audience was incredulous. This young guy, unknown guy, was claiming that he had scooped the field, scooped all the experts. And the subsequent discussions were acrimonious. And the tapes made at the time of that conference were said to have been lost. But eventually, Starzl's results had to be believed because he had brought with him charts, as depicted on this slide, detailing the daily progress of each patient, including laboratory tests, urine output, immunosuppressive drug doses, and so on. Well, Starzl's report caused a sensation. Quite suddenly and quite completely, it changed the outlook for transplantation. Boston surgeon and transplant historian uh, Nick Tilney described it as letting the genie out of the bottle. The news of the breakthrough spread quickly. Before the NRC conference, there had been only three active transplant programs in North America, Boston, Richmond, uh, and Denver. And as the effectiveness of the new uh, transplant protocol uh, became known, within a year there were 50 new programs in the country. And all of them adopted the Starzl cocktail immunosuppression. In fact, this protocol of Starzl's uh, remained the virtual world uh, standard for the next two decades. Starzl now felt <coughs> that 
he had the opportunity to approach his, his real goal, his primary goal, liver transplantation. But despite his extensive experience with the procedure in dogs, it proved to be very difficult in humans. In 1963, his first patient, and the world's first, bled to death on the operating table. And the next four died within a few days, causing Starzl to impose a moratorium on his program. The procedure was so violently controversial, even the governor of the state of Colorado weighed in against it on moral grounds, and Starzl's medical colleagues refused to send him their end-stage liver patients for transplantation. Uh, and for the next three years, after the moratorium, uh, for the next three years, Starzl, with further research and animal experiments, hundreds of, of transplants in animals, he addressed the problem of earlier failures. One important modification was the introduction of a new immunosuppressive agent, anti-lymphocyte globulin, which Starzl was also the first to employ clinically. And in 1967, Starzl performed the world's first successful liver transplants, and soon after, four more that were initially successful. Three of them are shown here with Carl Groth, who some of you might remember uh, is an international member of the APS. He was at that time Starzl's fellow. For the next 10 years, Starzl struggled to improve his results without much success. Uh, many of his patients survived, lived for months or several years, but at least half died within a year. Thus, he had proved liver transplantation was feasible, but it was still a qualified success. And to be accepted as a practical clinical service, further improvement would be necessary. In 1979, Starzl sensed that there might be a chance for such an improvement. Uh, th this is his group sitting around and talking about what they might do and not, not having any idea until in 1979, a new immunosuppressive drug was introduced in England by Roy Cowan, uh, the drug called cyclosporin, the wonder drug cyclosporin, but at the time it wasn't recognized as a wonder drug. After encouraging animal experiments, experiments, Cowan began to use it in human kidney transplants, but he found it was so toxic and causing so many infections, lymphomas, and failure of the kidneys, because it was toxic to the kidney as well, that, and then there were other trials in Boston and Canada that were similar to disappointing, causing many to believe it should be abandoned, including the company that made it, which was about to withdraw it from, the, from uh, distribution. But at this point, Tom Starzl came to the rescue of the new drug, and once again, as he had 20 years before with the Imuran, he began using it in appropriate doses and adding prednisone at the appropriate schedule and he made cyclosporin work safely and so effectively that it revolutionized the field. Shortly thereafter, in 1981, Starzl moved to the University of Pittsburgh, taking with him cyclosporin. There, for the next decade, he worked at a furious pace, causing him to lose all kinds of sleep. Uh, but performing as many as 600 transplants a year with excellent results. His consistently successful use of cyclosporin had transformed liver transplantation into a, uh, into a practical clinical service. His remarkable and consistent success with cyclosporin led to its acceptance as the standard baseline immunosuppression worldwide, just as Imuran had 20 years earlier, and cyclosporin remained the standard until 1989 when it was shown again by Starzl that there was a new drug, FK506, that he got from Japan that was even better. And that drug now has in large part replaced cyclosporin and is the usual baseline worldwide. And in addition, it's allowed successful small bowel and multivisceral transplants, which Starzl was also the first to accomplish. 
In 1990, Starzl developed angina and was forced to stop operating. After an emergency coronary artery bypass, he recovered completely, but decided that he would not return to operating again. Instead, freed of, all cons of, of an all-consuming operating schedule, which he had been submitting himself to for a number of decades, he elected to turn now his full attention and energy to research. Later, he was asked if he missed operating. Also, I, I was never, I was too much um, emotionally ruined uh, by the loss of people that I came to love. And um, I, I always felt like in some way, if somebody died who sh should have lived or could have lived, uh, that it, uh, it, it, was, it was a doomsday event for me. No, I, I, I didn't miss it at all. Uh, of course, the retreat was, uh, this all came to a screeching halt in 1990, and um, uh, I went back into research again, and uh, that, that turned out to be quite good, too. Sarzo frequently said he never regretted giving up surgery and was not sure he had ever enjoyed it. In addition, the assertion that research also might be good proved to be an understatement. His goal now was to discover the holy grail of transplantation, immunologic tolerance, which would allow drug-free immunosuppression. His innovations with immunosuppression had allowed excellent short and medium term, and medium term survival of allografts, but because of the toxicity of immunosuppressive drugs and late graft loss from chronic rejection, drug-free immunosuppression or tolerance remained the ultimate goal. Plans for introducing tolerance started with the 1953 demonstration by Billingham, Brent, and Medawar that chimerism induced in neonatal mice by inoculating them with donor cells would allow acceptance of donor strain grafts. In animal models, there has been continued exploration of this strategy for inducing tolerance. But in humans, the approach has been disappointing. In addition, since many successful transplants have been accomplished without inoculation of donor cells, it appeared to most people that donor cell chimer chimerism must be irrelevant. For 30 years, no one had suggested that those allografts that succeeded had succeeded because they harbored donor lymphoid cells, but it was Starzl's hypothesis that they did. In 1992, he decided to search for donor leukocyte chimerism. This was his research project. He decided to search for it in a group of patients that he thought were tolerant because they had retained their grafts for at least 30 years. And most of them were off all immunosuppression. So he thought these were tolerant patients. And he would search to see if they had these donor cells uh, if they had retained these donor cells for all these 20 or 30 years. And the cells frequently could not be found in blood, but he persuaded his patients to have biopsies of their various tissues. And when he searched these biopsies, he found that in all 30 patients, there were small numbers of donor cells. And because of this, uh, well, and the other, the other uh, finding uh, that was, the other concept that was important was that since these recipients had never received an inoculation of donor cells, the donor cells that they were retaining could only have come from the transplanted organ as passengers when the organ was transplanted. These patients did appear to be tolerant since they were off all immunosuppression. And this finding was the basis of Starzl's belief that chimerism is an important cause, not a consequence of successful transplantation. His demonstration of microchimerism in these patients has been an important stimulus 
for re-exploration of the approach for allograft tolerance in many centers, uh, centers. And we're going to hear more about that, I think, from Dr. Markman. Well, in, uh, this shows that those cells came from the came as passengers for the, from the liver transplant in this case. In recent years, Tom occasionally said uh, that he would slow down and devote time to his non-medical and scientific passions and interests, including Joy, his wife of 36 years. Joy is here to, with us this afternoon. Uh, his music, his collection of Mozart uh, recordings, which he said he had every one that had ever been made. I'm not sure whether that's correct or not, but he had a lot of them anyway. And very importantly, his dogs. Uh, let's see, did I skip some? No, that's, that's Joy, and uh, on the street that they named for him in Pittsburgh. Uh, and his dogs, which were very important to him, uh, ironically, since much of his work had been done with dogs, he was a dog fanatic, and he took his dogs with him to the office every day. Uh, well, anyway, these, this, this intent to slow up uh, never happened. Uh, instead, he continued to direct the Tom Starzl Transplantation Institute at the University of Pittsburgh and to search for methods of inducing tolerance. He made only one concession to the aging process. He stopped traveling to meetings unless he had to speak or what happened very frequently, frequently to accept a prize. Um, but he didn't apply this rule to his favorite society, the APS. And in his two decades of membership, he never missed a meeting. Tom Starzl was almost certainly the most widely honored surgeon of his time. He had 26 honorary degrees from U.S. and foreign universities, 20 honorary fellowships in surgical colleges of other countries, and more than 200, his more than 200 other awards included the highest ones of the American Surgical Association, the Transplantation Society, the American Philosophical Society, and also the President's National Medal of Science, the Lasker Award, and the only surgeon membership in the National Academy of Sciences. To the end of his life, Tom remained, uh, remained haunted by memories of tragic outcomes in his early transplant experience. On the other hand, he had every reason to be proud of the things that he had brought, he had brought about in the field. And I think a fitting close to this incomplete summary of Tom Starzl's contributions might be his own comments on the progress that was made in his time and its impact on medicine. What looked to be a hopeless uh, dream, fantasy, uh, has become a regular and very reliable service. It's gotten so good that um, uh, the only limit to transplantation is the fact that there aren't enough organs. Um, it transformed the uh, philosophy within one or two generations that guides medicine because uh, until the last 40 or 50 years, uh, if you had somebody with end-stage heart disease or liver disease or kidney disease, there was really nothing you could do except try to squeeze out the last day of life-sustaining function, and that's all she wrote. And then all of a sudden, uh, turn into the next chapter, and you can replace the whole engine, not just a spark plug or two. Uh, so it, it just, it totally changed the philosophy uh, uh, by which medicine is practiced. Well, I think that about sums it up. Starzl's influence has been multiplied by the accomplishments of the hundreds of surgeons who traveled to Colorado and Pittsburgh to learn from him and his disciples, his disciples and subsequent generations trained by them continue to lead the transplant programs of the world. And the next speaker is going to be one of those 
latter generations of his disciples or those trained by his disciples. Thank you.